Hey, CSU, welcome to another week as our week four group, An Uncontrolling God. And we have a very special guest today, uh, Thomas J. Ord, who's joining us from uh, a couple of oceans and hemispheres away. Uh, so Thomas J. Ord was introduced from uh, he's a theologian, philosopher, and a scholar of multidisciplinary studies, uh, editor and author of more than 20 books, and a professor in the American's Northwest. Uh, the book we're kind of centering on today is uh, The Uncontrolling Love of God, an open and relational account of providence is really great. I recommend people get yeah, it. Thanks. It's affordable and accessible. So, and if you want to know more, you can just go to thomasjord.com. So, Thomas, thanks for being here today. Hey, thanks so much for inviting me. That's great. Uh, maybe just uh, so we can get to know you, maybe just outside of what I've just said, uh, that kind of who you are. Maybe we'd love to know a bit more about you. And uh, a question we like to ask a lot of our guests since we're a university group is, uh, if you were to go back to uni as a student to study something completely new for the first time, what would you like to do? Ooh, probably if I had to go back to uh, my old studying days, I might do something in art. Um, I'm a photographer and a outdoors person. I do a lot of hiking, uh, backpacking. In fact, um, here in the States, we have a trail called the John Muir Trail in California that's more than 200 miles in the uh, Sierra uh, right. Nevada mountains and I hiked that this summer and did a bunch of photography. So I might do uh, some of that if I had to go back to college or university. It's impressive. Is that the track that um, the movie wild with Renee? Uh, it is. That's well, that yeah. I mean, wild is actually the whole Pacific crest trail, uh, right? but the John Muir trail is uh, one part of that. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. Um, I'm not, I mean, I like the outdoors enough, um, yeah. but I, uh, only so much, but I, I, I do, I, I get the idea of uh, getting out on a hiking trail. That's pretty cool. Uh, so maybe if we could start off about the book, uh, The Uncontrolling Love of God, um, maybe if you could give us just a bit of a general overview uh, of what the book's arguing and, and why you felt it was important to write it. Yeah, uh, the book is an attempt to talk about God's providence, um, a kind of category in theology that not a lot of people discuss very much because it has to take into account so many different elements of life as we know it and live it, who we think God is, what we think revelation is like, etc. But I especially wanted to focus on two issues. One if there is a God who is loving and powerful, why doesn't this God prevent genuine evil? Mm -hmm. And two, if this God is loving and powerful and providential, are there really chance or random events that occur in the world? Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the, the impulse to get, to, to get going on these ideas. Mm, yeah, that's great. Um, so, you begin the book with that kind of some real stories of suffering of, of evil. And some are like, uh, you know, random, as you say, and some are, you know, things that people have acted to enact great harm. Um, in this series that we're doing, we've kind of been talking uh, how to speak of God responsibly in light of different things, how to speak of God responsibly in light of oppression or the ecological crisis. And in this week, we're kind of looking at how to speak of God responsibly in light of suffering. Uh, why was it important for you to start with these kind of real life stories? And, and do you think that's an important thing for theology to begin with, the, the place yeah. on the ground? Yeah. I think so, because we all, we all deal with suffering and evil in our life. You know, some mm -hmm. people have it much worse than others. But um, even if it doesn't happen to me personally, I know of lots of horrific things that have happened in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Things that aren't just, you know, cutting your, your toe or losing a fingernail horrific, horrible things that make people who believe in God, and I'm a person who does believe in God, um, wonder what's going on here. You know, doesn't God really love us? Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought beginning with some examples to kind of to, to remind people of some of the bad things that happen in the world, I could have chosen thousands of mm -hmm. other ones. But to begin in that way, I think focuses the reader in on these key issues. And then with those illustrations in mind, then to begin to ask the questions I think must be asked of a God who is supposedly loving and supposedly powerful. Mm. Well, getting to that picture of God that you paint, um, which kind of insists that God's love comes first, that God's eternal nature is, is love. And so that proceeds and maybe and limits then God's power, meaning that God's power cannot be coercive because 
you know, what we know from our own experience, love can't coerce um, much as, you know, you might want to, you, you know, it, just, it stops being love at that point. Uh, so I, I thought when I was reading this, this kind of it does really, I feel, resolve or at least um, address in a very significant way how do we speak of God in that like traditional, like all knowing, all powerful, but all loving being. Um, could you maybe expand a little on this idea of a canonic, non-coercive love and how you feel it addresses uh, traditional shortcomings? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think just about every Christian, every believer, even in other religious traditions, wants to say God is good and loving. And they want to say God is powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but then the question becomes, how do you reconcile chance and evil, like I've mentioned, in light of those? Well, this passage in uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians has become famous for his, this word, kenosis. It's actually in some other passage of Scripture as well. But in this particular passage, it talks about this self-giving and what I call others' empowering love that Jesus expresses and that many theologians, myself included, think tells us something about who God is, what God's nature is like. Now, most people who take this canonic idea and, and go and run with it, they have the notion that God has voluntarily chosen to be self-limited, to give freedom and agency and existence to the world, and this voluntary choice on God's part, God could have made us all robots and could have controlled everything, but God voluntarily chose to be self-limited in order for us to have freedom, etc. cetera. Hmm. Uh, I like that view, except that it presents a huge problem. And that is, if this is a choice on God's part, if God could take away your freedom or the rapist's freedom or the torturer's freedom, why wouldn't a God of love momentarily take that away? Why wouldn't this God restrain the rapist, restrain the, the torturer, or fiddle with the elements that would control the situation so that these atrocious evils don't occur? Mm. Now, there's another line of theological thinking that says, well, God just can't be in control because there's some sort of external forces. You know, there's maybe uh, another demon out there, or Satan, or there's metaphysical laws, or the God-world relationship. God's kind of, you know, trying to break free, but just can't, and is mm. opposing some outside force. Mm. My proposal says God really is limited in God's power, but it's not some outside force constraining God. It's God's own nature. And this nature is such that God can't take away freedom and agency from others, which means God can't unilaterally prevent these atrocities that happen in the world. And God can't because God's nature is canonic love that necessarily gives freedom and agency to the world. And God can't interrupt that gift. Mm, that's, that's great. Now, like in light of that, like I think that's really helpful when I was reading. Well, thanks. <laughs> and like, I think like, you know, cause suffering is such a thing and this offers a new way and yet still preserves God of love, God who is love. I believe so. Yeah. Now, however, I feel like it's still very resisted, uh, this idea, and it's still, come, you know, you're going to bring this up, it's going to come against a lot of um, yeah, resistance and antagonism. Do you have any thoughts on why that is so, uh, so hard to resist, uh, so, sorry, so readily resisted? And perhaps yeah. how would you approach, you know, if you're talking to a friend or a family member and you want to bring this up, uh, and there's someone who maybe holds the all, all, all kind of idea of God? Yeah, I mean, I think for most people, the first thing they think of when they think of God is power. Mm. And then when they think that God is the most powerful or powerful to the nth degree, mm. then they think, well, that means God can do anything. And that then leads them into these problems that we've already talked about. Mm. Um, you know, probably been 10 years ago or so, there was a movie called Bruce Almighty. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that one. Uh, I think it's Morgan Freeman has plays God in it. And yep. Gary. And, mm -hmm. and I always think it's interesting that when a movie producer decides to do a movie about God, they mm -hmm. would call it Bruce Almighty, not Bruce All Loving or mm -hmm. some other sort of moral attribute. Why? Because I think people naturally go to the power thing first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I talk to people, I want to say, do you really think 
a God who could control is the best way to go about life or understand life. I mean, you know, I oftentimes when I present these things, I'll say, you know, if you have a controlling boss, do you think that person is loving? Mm -hmm. If you have a controlling boyfriend or girlfriend, do you really think that's the greatest example of love in the world? I don't think so. And most of us don't think so if we start to work through those things. So if I begin to work with personal experiences and push people to think about what absolute power must entail, a lot of them begin to think, well, maybe I need to think differently about God's power. Mm. I like that. I like like in the book, you kind of, especially when you're talking about uh, making a case for free will and making a case for randomness and chance, you often just point out, this is just how we live our lives. We live our lives with an accept, you know, this understanding that we have freedom. But of course, when we come to write about it, then we maybe, you know, change our minds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. you know, sometimes we'll look at certain, you know, studies in neuroscience or mm -hmm. genetics, and uh, the sciences sometimes impose certain metaphysical assumptions onto their results. Uh, I, however, think that the things we know best are our own experience. Mm -hmm. And we all have this experience of having some kind of freedom. It's limited freedom. We can't do anything. I can't be, beat Usain Bolt, you know, in the 200 <laughs> in the Olympics. But I have some freedom. I've got mm -hmm. freedom right now to express myself in the next sentence differently than I might if I chose a different route. So given that limited kind of freedom and given that we really think chance events happen in the world, when I throw the dice playing a game, I don't think it's been predetermined. Mm. This kind of way that we live our lives, I think, actually helps us to believe that God is a God of love rather than hurts us. Mm, that's great. So one of the things that kind of was coming to mind when I was uh, reading the book was, was thinking about, so then what is, I guess, the role of God? And, and I guess particularly specify me, what's the role of prayer? Uh, I was remembering back to like, uh, I was like playing a cricket final. So uh, that might not mean much. We have to translate it. I'll say I was playing a baseball final. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and um, we were in a bit of a troubled situation and uh, we, we, the clouds started rolling in. And because we had finished higher than the other team on the ladder in the regular season, if the game got washed out, we would win the premiership. So, ah. you know, I started like sitting in the field looking at these clouds and saying a little prayer for rain. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sure, you know, this is obviously a, a trivial example, but and people pray for car parks. But we also pray against much deeper evils and that God will uh, act in these situations. So I was wondering how you feel this, this change um, in the picture of God uh, maybe affects prayer. It does affect the way we pray, or at least how we ought to think about prayer. Mm -hmm. If we think our prayers somehow manipulate God or twist God's arm and force God to do something, then this way of thinking about God is not going to fit very well with that notion of prayer. If God's sort of a slot machine and you stick in your coin and you pull the right lever and then whatever comes down, the candy bar comes down at the bottom, mm -hmm. if that's what you think prayer is all about, then it's not going to fit my model. However, my model says God is intimately engaged in our lives, and God is, in, is present to all things in the entire universe, and what we do has a real effect on God. I'm what's called an open and relational theologian, and by that I mean that God is related to us such that God not only influences us, but we have an influence on God. So our prayers can make a difference in the world. They don't force God to do something. They don't change the laws of nature, but they can open up new possibilities for God and for us and for other creatures to act because our actions make a difference in the world and make a difference to God. That's great. Well, Thomas, that's really helpful. And uh, we're, I'm sure we're going to really enjoy uh, talking about this in our groups uh, this coming week. Uh, other than the book or checking out your website, is there anything else you want to uh, promote or anything like that? Uh, <laughs> well, I just appreciate you uh, taking on this kind of conversation. I mean, these, are, these are really big and important questions, I think, whether you believe in God or not. Mm. I'm a person who believes in God, and I'm trying to make sense out of that belief and sense out of my life. And this book is uh, my attempt to do that on the issues of chance and suffering. That's exceptional. So that's the book. It's The Uncontrolling Love of God. Uh, you can get it like anywhere, Book Depository, A-Books, always good online stores for us here in Australia. So check that out. 
And uh, yeah, uh, Thomas, thank you very much. Guys, we'll see you in groups Monday and Thursday in the U-Bar and Wednesday online. Uh, stay around. We'll see you later.